right out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out podcast. I'm your host, Josh, and today I'm going to be diving into some of the most infamous cases of Halloween homicide. Today, the day I'm recording this episode, is in fact October 31st, the official holiday of Lights Out. Halloween. Happy Halloween, everybody. The original plan was to put this episode up on Halloween, but due to my scrambled brain since becoming a parent and my busy schedule, I totally screwed up the scheduling of this episode. So you're actually watching this on Friday after Halloween, Halloween being on Monday. So I apologize. I meant for this to go up on Halloween, but instead I'm recording this on Halloween. So nevertheless, I think this is still going to be a very interesting episode diving into maybe some cases you've heard of before and maybe some other cases of homicide on Halloween that you haven't heard of. But before I get into today's episode, I noticed on my last episode on the haunted house disasters that a lot of you seem to not be aware of what happened to Joel, my producer. Joel left the show to go pursue some other opportunities professionally. He is not a part of Lights Out in any way anymore. But the good news is that I will not be doing the show completely by myself for much longer. Actually, in the next week or two, I want to say, I will be unveiling my new producer slash co-host of the show, which I'm very excited about because this person has actually been working behind the scenes on the show for quite a while now, at least a year or so. So I'm very excited for them to be joining me. And I think you're going to really enjoy the dynamic that we have together. But this episode of Lights Out is brought to you by Honey and Green Chef. More on them later. But is it a coincidence that some of the most brutal murders happen on Halloween? Or is the spooky day just a catalyst for mayhem? If you actually look at crime statistics, pretty much across the United States and most major cities, crime on Halloween goes up 17 to 24%. So there's definitely a spike in crime. So today, we're going to take a look at six different cases of Halloween homicide. Maybe it's just coincidence that these events happened on this holiday, but some of them have direct ties to Halloween itself. With that being said, we're going to begin by talking about probably one of the most infamous cases that ever happened on Halloween. In 1974, there was a man named Ronald Clark O'Brien, who was a 30-year-old father of two, and he was living with his wife, Danine, and their two kids in Deer Park, Texas. His two kids were named Timothy and Elizabeth. Timothy was eight years old, and Elizabeth was two. Ronald worked as an optician at Texas State Optical in Southwest Houston. He was also a deacon at his Second Baptist Church. At his church, he also sang in the choir and ran a local bus program for churchgoers. People who knew him thought he was a stand-up guy, and his pastor knew him as a good Christian man and above-average father. Even though he looked like an upstanding family man from the outside, he would later be known as the Candy Man, as well as the man who killed Halloween. So on Halloween night, 1974, Ronald took his two kids out trick-or-treating in Pasadena, Texas, They also went with one of their neighbors, Jimmy Bates, and his two kids after sharing dinner together. They eventually came to a house where the lights were off, but the kids figured that they would knock anyways and try to get some candy. When no one answered, they ran off to the next house. The kids got a few houses ahead of Ronald while they knocked on each door, but he later caught back up with the kids. He then told them that the house they just went to, where the lights were off and no one answered, actually did have candy. He then pulled out a bunch of jumbo pixie sticks, if you remember those, and handed them over to his two kids, as well as Jimmy's kids, and another kid that Ronald had recognized from church. After trick-or-treating for a little bit longer, the night got cut short when it started to rain, so everyone decided to call it a night and head home. When they got back, Timothy asked his dad if he could eat some candy from his bag before he went to bed. Ronald said yes, but only one piece. So Timothy took a look at his candy, And he decided, you know what? I want to have the full-size pixie stick. After opening the tube, he noticed that the powder was hardened 
and stuck inside. So Ronald shook it up to loosen the powder before giving it back to his son. As all kids do, Timothy then tilted up the tube and swallowed some of that powder in there. But immediately he complained that this supposedly sweet candy tasted very bitter and disgusting. Ronald went into the kitchen to get his son a glass of Kool-Aid to wash it down, which as a parent, I'd be wondering what the hell. Candy shouldn't be bitter. You shouldn't need Kool-Aid to wash it down. After consuming some of this powder, Timothy almost immediately complained about an upset stomach. He quickly ran down to the hall bathroom, where he began violently puking. Soon after, he fell to the floor and began convulsing. Ronald ran over to pick up his son from the floor. Vomit drizzled from his son's mouth, and then he felt Timothy's body go limp in his arms. His wife, Danine, wasn't home at the time, as she had gone over to a friend's house. So Ronald ran to the landline and called 911. Luckily, an ambulance was right around the block. Paramedics loaded Timothy into the back of the ambulance and rushed him to the hospital. But by the time he arrived, the young boy was already dead. His heart had stopped. It was less than an hour after eating that powdered candy. It became very clear to the medical staff that he had actually been poisoned. So the medical examiner, who happened to be nearby from Harris County, was called in immediately. And he asked the staff what the boy's breath smelled like. The morgue staff leaned over the boy's mouth and reported a strange scent of almonds. Which out of all the poisons, cyanide is known for giving off a bitter almond smell. After an autopsy, they confirmed that poor Timothy had consumed enough cyanide to kill two full-sized adults. The traces of poison were also found in his stomach vomit and in his bloodstream. Apparently, the top two inches of the pixie stick had been packed with cyanide. Up until now, poisoning kids with Halloween candy had been a horror story talked about for years before this. Most were just myths and urban legends. But this was the first major poisoning ever reported on Halloween. Authorities quickly fanned out and recovered the other pixie sticks handed out that night, and luckily no one else had eaten theirs yet. They noticed that the tubes had been tampered with and stapled shut. This wasn't unusual since in the old times, they did used to be folded and stapled shut. But it was obvious that someone had opened them up and stapled them shut again. Luckily, one of the staples ended up saving a kid's life that night. They were actually found in bed with the pixie sticks, struggling to get it open before the police came and took it away. Meanwhile, in the investigation, Ronald was working with the police. Since his son's death, he had disguised himself as a concerned father trying to figure out who had tried to poison the neighborhood kids. With the police, he went back to the neighborhood where they went trick-or-treating that night and he tried to point out the house where he said he had gotten the pixie sticks from. But of course, conveniently, he couldn't remember which house it actually was. He said that all he could remember was that the house that they got them from, the lights had been off. And when they approached the house, all he saw was a hairy arm coming out of the front door, holding the pixie sticks. A very believable story, of course. Ronald and the police walked up and down the street a few times, and the whole time they're not really buying his story, and they continue questioning Ronald. Maybe a certain house would jog his memory, or maybe Ronald would finally admit to something. Police thought it was very suspicious because Ronald and his kids weren't even out that long. The rain had cut the night short, so why couldn't he remember which house they got the pixie sticks from? Eventually, Ronald said he remembered which one. He pointed it out to the police, and the police went to interview the owner. The house was owned by a man named Courtney Melvin, an air traffic controller, but he wasn't home. So they went to Houston Hobby Airport where he worked and arrested him on the spot. Meanwhile, the news broke about the poisoning. Parents ended up bringing in loads of their children's Halloween candy to the police station. As you can imagine, they were terrified that perhaps there was other candy that had been tampered with. Once police got their suspect into custody, Courtney, they started questioning him and they realized that he had a very solid alibi for Halloween night. He was working at the airport that night. Almost 200 other employees were working that night as well and actually saw him. His wife and daughter were home, but they had turned off the lights because they didn't want to hand out candy. Police questioned everyone in the neighborhood and realized none of the homes were handing out full-sized pixie sticks. So Ronald quickly became the prime suspect. When investigators looked a bit deeper, they discovered he was nearly $100,000 in debt, which is over half a million dollars in today's money. He had actually defaulted on several personal loans his car was about to be repossessed and the family home had been foreclosed on. 
He also could barely hold down a job and had been employed 21 different times over the past 10 years. And when they looked into that further, he had actually been fired from every single one. In the fall of 1974, he was about to be fired again for suspicion of theft. Looking a bit deeper, they found even more suspicious evidence. Earlier in January, Ronald had taken out life insurance policies on his own children for $10,000 each. A month before Halloween, he took out an additional $20,000 in policies. And a few days before Halloween, he took out two more, an additional $20,000 on his kids. So all of those life insurance policies totaled around $60,000. He also kept the policies hidden from his wife the entire time. The morning after his son died, he reached out to the insurance company to ask about the payout. Meanwhile, the police were still doing their investigation, and unfortunately all the evidence against Ronald was circumstantial. So the police then obtained a search warrant to search his house. Once they got inside, they found a pocket knife with traces of candy sugar on the blade and a pair of scissors with plastic sticking to them. This plastic matched the pixie sticks. So police arrested him and took him in for more questioning. And the more they dug, the more obvious everything became. Ronald had actually taken a chemistry class at Harris County Community College a while back. And during that class, he would ask the professor, how much poison would it take to kill small animals? And he asked which poisons were the most lethal. Then in September, he called a friend who worked at Arco Chemical Company. He also asked questions about the varieties of cyanide and how to get his hands on it. It's often used in pest control and metalworking, but obviously Ronald's job as an optician didn't require either of those. His co-workers also noticed that he talked about cyanide a lot. Not long after, he had reached out to Curt and Matheson Scientific Company, a chemical outlet in Houston. They only sold cyanide in large quantities, but Ronald asked the salesperson if they would sell him a smaller amount. With all this evidence clearly mounting against him, police were able to charge Ronald O'Brien on November 5th, 1974 for the murder of his own son. But Ronald would keep protesting that he was innocent. He actually pled not guilty, and his defense team kept trying to blame it on a mysterious neighbor who had been handing out poison candy. They even tried to get the jury to buy into the idea that the urban legend was real, and the killer was an unknown stranger living in the neighborhood. Ronald actually never confessed and maintained his innocence throughout the entire trial. The prosecution believed that he had planned to kill both of his children for the insurance money. And he wanted to kill the other children as well. So it would look like someone random in the neighborhood had been handing out poison candy that night. Even his own wife testified against him in court, which is very brave. As you can imagine, this case generated a ton of media buzz. We actually have a news clip of the Ronald O'Brien trial. Most of today's testimony came from Jimmy Bates, a close friend of the O'Brien family. Bates said that before Halloween, O'Brien asked if he could bring his children over to trick-or-treat with the Bates children on Halloween night. Both families ate dinner together and then the fathers took the children trick-or-treating. Bates said O'Brien went to one house where no one appeared to be home and after the children had scampered ahead to the next house, O'Brien came off the front porch carrying the pixie sticks. He gave the pixie sticks to the children and then later took them back and said he wanted to stop at his car for a moment. Bates said when O'Brien came back into the Bates house, he returned the pixie sticks to the children. Later that night, Timothy O'Brien died from eating a poisoned pixie stick. But on June 3rd, the jury came to a verdict after 46 minutes. They ended up finding Ronald guilty of one count of murder and four counts of attempted murder. The judge then sentenced him to execution by an electric chair. Soon after, his wife also filed for divorce, and Ronald never saw his wife or his daughter again. While he spent the rest of his life on death row, the other inmates hated him. Even the most violent, heinous criminals out there looked down on people who murdered children. Ronald ended up trying to appeal his conviction, but never succeeded. As the years went by, the methods of execution had changed, as the Supreme Court actually found death by electrocution to be cruel and an unusual punishment. So therefore, they changed his execution method to lethal injection. And on March 31st, 1984, almost 10 years after he murdered his son, Ronald ordered his last meal, which apparently was a well-done steak and a Boston cream pie. He'd also agreed to donate his eyes in cataracts transplants. He was then executed at Texas State Penitentiary by lethal injection. 
When they announced his death at 12.48 a.m., the crowd that had gathered outside cheered and threw candy into the air. Ever since that one tragic Halloween night, 1974, there has not been one reported case of death from Halloween candy poisoning to this day. But the idea and urban legend out there, some crazy person poisoning kids' candy, handing out razor blades, still lives on. And there have been instances of people putting razor blades in candy, believe it or not. In the end, I think it's important to remember that just because it's only happened once doesn't mean that it could happen again. And for now, Ronald O'Brien will always be known as the man who killed Halloween. But for some, Halloween had already been ruined long before the Candyman had come along. One woman experienced the horrors of a violent murderer who many believe she willingly let into her home. In 1963, Catherine Lillian Armstrong was a 70-year-old woman who lived on her own in Sandyford, Newcastle, England. She was a school teacher who had retired in 1957 from Denton Road Junior School. She was also a devout Methodist who attended the Central United Methodist Church. But on Halloween night, 1963, Catherine was expected to arrive at the church for a weekly choir practice. Much of her schedule revolved around church activities, and they held choir practice at 7.30 every Thursday evening. But this time, she never showed up. And this was very strange, because Catherine almost never missed practice. About an hour before, she was seen by two neighborhood children looking out her first floor window. She was never seen leaving the house, though. The next morning, her cousin... Ada Ridley decided to stop by Catherine's house to say hello. She noticed that the curtains were drawn, which was weird because Catherine usually had them open to let the morning light in. Ada knocked on the front door around 10.30 a.m., but there was no answer. She then knocked again a few minutes later and waited, but still there was nothing. It was at that point that Ada knew something was wrong because Catherine was usually awake really early in the morning, so at that point she called the police. And they got there a few minutes later, after knocking and yelling for Catherine, there was still no answer. So the police forced their way inside the front door. There at the bottom of her staircase, they found Catherine's body sprawled on the floor. She wore a dress and a pair of slippers. Besides the slippers, it had looked like she had gotten ready to go to choir practice the night before. She had an nylon stocking wrapped tightly around her neck, though, and her face was completely red with blood. The skin around her eyes and mouth were cut and shredded with large wounds. Police also noticed that she had defensive marks on her hands. Even though they found no weapons at the crime scene, those defensive wounds on her hands looked like they were made by a large, bladed weapon. And Catherine had fought back so aggressively that they believed that she had actually made her attacker bleed because they found additional bloodstains all across the house. They also noticed no sign of a break-in or a forced entry. This meant that Catherine might have personally known her killer, but they found no footprints, or fingerprints, and nothing had been stolen, and her body hadn't been moved. She was later taken in for an autopsy where they discovered she had been stabbed a total of 28 times in the face and neck. Clearly, there was rage behind this murder, but they couldn't figure out who would want to do something like this to a 70-year-old woman. This was very, very violent and gruesome, and the police absolutely needed to figure out who did this, and quick. So they launched a massive investigation. Police holidays were canceled, and anyone who was already on vacation was called back in. A team of 60 detectives began working the case, and the first thing they needed to find was the murder weapon. They thought that maybe the weapon would have been discarded at the scene, or right after the murderer left the house. So they searched through all the drains, grates, gardens, and streams along the nearby streets. They also went house to house and interviewed everyone that they could in a half mile radius around her home. By November 4th, they had taken over 200 statements, and they would eventually knock on the doors of nearly 5,000 houses, making this the city's biggest investigation to date. The problem was, no one they spoke to knew anything about it. No one saw anything out of the ordinary that night, and there were no witnesses, and there was really not that much evidence. So police began looking into previous convictions of violent crimes against older women in the area. They set up a base at a nearby church hall and dug as deep as they could. The focus of the investigation was trying to figure out those last few hours of Catherine's life. She was last seen by the two children through her window, and she wasn't found until the next morning. So there was about a 16-hour gap 
a timeline that needed to be filled, but it was a gap that would remain empty forever. Only Catherine and her killer knew what happened that night. Catherine's cousin Ada believed she was killed by a group of teenagers in a Halloween prank gone wrong, but there was absolutely no evidence to back this up. In the end, the police conducted over 5,000 interviews, but all of them went nowhere and the case went cold. Many believe that if the blood samples from the house had been preserved, the case could have been solved with modern DNA evidence, but no blood samples from the scene remained, and the nylon stocking around her throat was eventually lost, so Catherine's death might be a mystery forever. But this story gets a little bit stranger. By 1973, 10 years later, new tenants had moved into her old home. Only after living there for a couple months, they packed up their stuff and left. When a new tenant asked why they left, they said it was because the house was haunted. The newest tenant was named Joanne Black, and she said that the people who lived in the house before her believed a ghost also lived in the home. They had actually sensed the presence of a ghost many times, and they had even seen the figure of a woman out of the corner of their eye. The figure was always seen at the bottom of the stairs. I don't really know what's scarier though, knowing that Catherine's brutal killer is still out there, or the fact that People who now live in the home believe that perhaps the spirit of Catherine is still imprisoned in that home forever because of what had happened to her. It seems unlikely that Catherine's case will be solved due to the lack of evidence that was preserved, but I hope in one way or another, Catherine's loved ones get justice for her one day. But Catherine is on a very long list of victims who had lost their life on October 31st. The next on the list is a bit different from Catherine's murder because the motive became clear as day. And I'll get into that right after I take this break to thank our sponsors. I'll be right back. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. I do pretty much all my shopping online. I rarely go out to a store and buy anything anymore. It's just so much easier to do it online. You can do it at the convenience of your home or wherever you're at. And also, you can't really use Honey in a physical store. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is a free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. So for example, I was shopping for some new winter jackets the other day. I went to one of my favorite websites, found the jackets that I wanted, and they actually were on sale. Add them to the cart. When I got to checkout, Honey pops up a little window at the top of my browser and it says apply coupons so i hit the little button apply coupons it goes through tries all the different promo codes that are available and voila just like magic I actually saved an additional 10 percent off and got free shipping on that order that was already a couple hundred dollars so i saved a ton of money just by pressing a button it's that simple and what's great is that honey doesn't just work on your desktop it also works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go, which is super convenient. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. I never recommend something I don't use and I use it every day. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash lights out. It's one word. That's joinhoney.com slash lights out. But with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into our next case, which I'm calling Trick or Treat Terror. So the killers in this case were an unlikely couple back in the 1950s. They were actually a lesbian couple, and they shook LA to its core. It all began with a happy couple, Peter and Betty Fabiano, and they met in the late 1940s. Peter was an ex-Marine, and Betty was a beautiful divorcee with two children. They married in 1950 and lived in Kingston, New York. At the time, Peter worked as a truck driver, and later in 1956, they moved out to L.A. and ran two beauty shops. Peter ended up hiring a woman named Joan Rebel. Joan was a 40-year-old freelance photographer who took writing classes at the University of Honolulu in the late 40s. She had been married before, but she was now a single woman who preferred women. And over time, she grew close to the married couple at the beauty shop. And soon, the Fabiano started having problems. Peter and Betty's relationship dwindled, and Betty grew closer to Joan. She even ended up moving in with Joan in 1957. They had a strong bond together, and Peter felt immediately threatened. 
Peter and Betty eventually got back together, but only under the condition that Betty cut off all contact with Joan. Soon after, Joan began a relationship with a woman named Goldine Pizer. Goldine was from Rockford, Illinois, and the daughter of German immigrants. By 1940, she moved to L.A. and got work as a secretary. In 1944, she married a pharmacist, but soon got a divorce. And ever since, she began dating women. In their previous marriages, they had to hide their true sexuality. But they now felt free. And when Joan and Goldine started seeing each other, Joan still wasn't over Betty. And she was jealous Betty had dumped her to get back with her husband. That jealousy soon grew into a revenge fantasy. And that fantasy became a reality on Halloween night, 1957. Goldine and Joan had driven out to a suburb called Sun Valley. Goldine was dressed up in blue jeans and a khaki jacket with red gloves and heavy makeup. Then she added a domino mask to her face, making her look like a sidekick superhero. They both sat in the front seats of the car waiting outside Betty and Peter's home. They waited there until the bedroom light finally went off, a little after 11 p.m. Joan told Goldine it was time. So Goldine took a brown paper bag, approached the house and rang the front doorbell. Peter got out of bed to answer the door, just thinking he was an innocent, late-night trick-or-treater. As he opened the door, he said, It's a little late for this, isn't it? Goldine just stood there shaking. Then she answered no, and began lifting up the brown paper bag which was over her hands, soon revealing that she was holding a loaded revolver. Next, a loud bang echoed through the neighborhood. The bullet tore through the bag and hit Peter in the center of his chest. He grabbed at his chest before falling straight to the floor. Goldine then rushed back to the car where Joan was sitting in the passenger seat with a smile on her face. She kissed Goldine and thanked her before they sped off into the night. They then burned their clothes and returned the car they had borrowed from a friend. Before Joan and Goldine parted ways, Joan took her by the hands, looked in her eyes and said, Forget you ever knew me. The next morning, Goldine realized she still had the 38 Smith & Wesson revolver she had used the night before. So she went to a department store in downtown LA, rented a locker, and left the gun inside. As for Betty Fabiano, she ran out of bed after hearing the gunshot on Halloween night. There she found her husband lying on the floor by the front door, bleeding with a bullet lodged just beneath his heart. Her 15-year-old daughter ran to call 911, and they rushed Peter to a nearby hospital, but he had lost too much blood and died soon after arriving. Betty was absolutely torn apart by this. She was just in complete shock, and it was so intense that they actually had to give her drugs in order for her to remain sedated in the hospital before even speaking to police. Finally, after several days, she made herself available for questioning, and Betty told police that she had heard two voices outside her home on Halloween night. One sounded masculine, and the other sounded like a man impersonating a woman. Police decided to dig into Peter's background to look for someone with a motive to kill him. They thought his murder was similar to a gang or mafia assassination, so they wanted to know why Peter was the target. They found a misdemeanor charge of bookmaking back in 1948, but besides that, Peter had no connection to criminal activity. Betty then told police she only knew of one person in the entire world that would want to hurt Peter, and then it became so obvious to her it had to have been Joan. Police tracked down Joan and interviewed her, but they released her for lack of evidence. Two weeks later, the murder weapon was discovered in the department store locker. The weapon was actually registered to Goldine. So police arrested her on November 12th, and she quickly confessed to the murder. And then she told the police that, well, Joan had actually seduced me, and then coerced me into killing Peter. By December, police set up a meeting between Joan and Goldine as well as their lawyers in order to get the full story. Goldine said that Joan had convinced her Peter was an evil man who destroyed everything around him. She said he mistreated his wife and was a drug dealer. Goldine then told police that Joan bought a gun using her money. Joan even drove her by Betty and Peter's home a few weeks before the murder so that she would know his face. During Goldine's confession, Joan didn't say a word. They ended up both being charged and their trial was set for late December. The judge ordered for three psychiatrists to evaluate the women before going to trial. Goldine confessed that her only motive was to please Joan, and she admitted she had always been easily influenced and always trusting. One of the psychiatrists believed that Goldine was telling the truth. She would do anything to save her friend Joan from an evil man. 
During the trial, they both pleaded not guilty. Goldine pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, and she cried on the stand while admitting her crimes to the court, and Joan only smiled as they escorted her out of the courtroom at the end of the day. In the end, they were both found guilty and charged with first-degree murder. It was eventually reduced to second-degree murder after they agreed to a plea deal, and they were both sentenced to five years to life in prison. Their sentences, though, quickly became controversial. A few months after their convictions, news articles criticized how women were being treated softly in the courtroom, and they used this case as an example. A man had been murdered in cold blood, and the minimum amount of time in prison was only five years. Goldine was eventually released from prison at some point and continued to live in the L.A. area. In 1971, she became an officer of the Miracle Mile chapter of the Professional Women's Club. She ended up dying at the age of 83 in 1998. As for Joan, she was also released at some point, but there's been no trace of her after her time in prison. Betty went on to live a full life with her two children and tried to move on from this terrible tragedy, and she ended up passing away in 1999 at the age of 81. No one knows if Betty, Goldine, or Joan ever reconnected in their lifetimes, but this tragedy just shows how strong jealousy and love can play. It also shows how you never really know who's going to show up at your door. Trick or treating. This year, I've also been really getting into cooking. I love to eat food. I probably look like I eat a lot of food. Well, that's because I do. But with my busy schedule, it can make making home-cooked meals a bit harder than it needs to be. But thanks to Green Chef, which is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wide array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands, and now my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with Lights Out. Green Chef is great because it's the number one meal kit for eating well, with dinners that work for you, not the other way around. Green Chef has options for every lifestyle. If you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, you're looking for fast and fit, Mediterranean and gluten-free, Green Chef is a meal kit for you. Green Chef also makes sticking to a carb-conscious lifestyle easy, which I've been trying to do. I love my carbs, but I'm trying to cut a few if I can, and Green Chef really helps me out with that. This holiday season, choose Green Chef for premium balanced recipes that support your wellness goals and taste good too. I know heading into holiday season, I feel like we all put on a little bit of weight because we love to eat those holiday treats, and by no means don't skip the holiday treats, but for your regular meals, Try Green Chef because it'll help you just eat healthier and help balance out those holiday treats that you're, you know you're going to want to eat. Those fast and fit meals, which I love, are under 700 calories and ready in 25 minutes or less. Best of all, everything's pre-measured. I don't have to buy any groceries. And it's easy to put those recipes together with the recipe cards. Green Chef is also the only meal kit that is both carbon and plastic offset. What's also cool is that 100% of their seafood meets the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Rankings of certified best choice or good alternative and with green chef you'll reduce your food waste by at least 23 percent versus grocery shopping which is awesome i love green chef i made a buffalo chicken the other night with them and it was absolutely delicious it was healthy and it was super easy to make so give them a try today and go to greenchef.com slash lights out 599 and use code lights out 599 to get five dollars and 99 cents per meal on your first box and your first box ships free Again, go to greenchef.com slash lightsout599 and use code lightsout599 to get $5.99 per meal on your first box and your first box ships free because Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. While Peter Fabiano had no idea who was at the door, one man in 2008 was 100% sure that whoever was knocking on his door on Halloween was coming to kill him. Quentin Patrick was 27 years old when he heard a knock on his front door on Halloween night. His front porch light was on, which is the usual sign that it's okay for a trick-or-treater to approach the house, but Quentin thought something else was going on. He heard his girlfriend scream when she looked out the window. She told him that there were three large men at the front door, and they were wearing masks and carried ropes in their hands, like weapons. Quentin knew a rival drug dealer was out to kill him. He thought this was the dealer and his goons coming to murder him. So Quentin ran and grabbed an AK-47 from his kitchen, aimed it at the front door, and fired off 30 rounds. The bullets shredded through the wooden door, and screams could be heard on the opposite side. When the dust settled, Quentin opened the front door as he looked down. A 12-year-old boy named TJ lay it on the ground, bleeding out from multiple gunshot wounds. He was also wearing a Halloween costume with a ghoul mask, 
just like his brother who was with him. They had sprinted up to the door with their bags of candy in hand. All they wanted was to say trick or treat and get some candy. But instead, a hail of bullets came through the front door, killing TJ almost instantly. Quentin Patrick, the shooter, ended up pleading guilty, and he was sentenced to 16 years for being a felon in possession of a weapon, as well as 30 years for homicide. An absolutely tragic story, and why nowadays, there's no reason not to have a video doorbell so you can actually see who's at your door, and not just presume that it's somebody there to kill you. But there's other times that terror disguises itself as a harmless man of God. In 2012, John D. White was a pastor of a small congregation in Birmingham Township, Michigan. He had about 14 people in his congregation who saw him as a holy man. John had a troubled past as an ex-convict, but many believed he was born again and an honest man now dedicated to God. But they didn't know the whole story. On Halloween 2012, his soon-to-be stepdaughter, Rebecca Gay, suddenly went missing. John asked his congregation at Christ Community Fellowship Church to pray for her safe return. But deep down, he knew the truth, and soon his followers would too. John had served in the Navy and worked as a truck driver when he was young. His first known violent attack against a woman happened in 1980, when he was only 22 years old. He lived in Battle Creek, Michigan, and he was married at the time. One day, he invited his 17-year-old neighbor, Teresa Etherton, to come into his basement to check out a miniature stock car racetrack he had set up. While she was distracted, he grabbed a knife and pounced on her from behind. He took her to the ground and stabbed her 15 times, and then proceeded to strangle her. As he straddled her, the last thing he told her was, You're going to go now. I'm really sorry you had to go like this, but what the fuck? You're just a woman. Surprisingly, Teresa survived the assault, and police arrested John. He went to prison after the assault, but he appealed the conviction and won. He argued that his attorney hadn't raised an insanity defense, so he didn't have a proper trial. So John was let free in 1983 after serving only two years in prison. They gave him two years probation and mandatory mental health treatment. Years later, Teresa had no idea that her attacker was a free man until she stood in line at a grocery store. She thought she recognized his voice, but thought there was absolutely no way that this man could have ever gotten out of prison. But when she turned around to look, she saw him smiling right at her. Her worst nightmare was a free man. Only Teresa knew what kind of evil they had just set free, and many more women were about to find out. In July of 1994, a 26-year-old woman named Vicki Sue Wall disappeared from Comstock Township, Michigan. Meanwhile, John was still married to his wife, and now he had two children and another baby on the way. John had found work at a textile company where he worked maintenance. And this is where he met Vicki Wall. The two became close and eventually had an affair together. A surveillance video from the local grocery store parking lot saw Vicki get into a black pickup truck with a bearded man late at night. And this was sadly the last time she was ever seen alive. Police identified the truck and the man, and it was none other than John D. White. When they picked him up for questioning, John admitted to having an affair with Vicki but he swore that he dropped her off safely later on that night. Police, of course, didn't believe him, but they didn't have a body, and they had no real evidence, so they couldn't charge him with a crime. But about six weeks later, Vicky's body was found dumped in a rural area about two miles from the grocery store where she was last captured on video. Her body at this point was extremely decomposed, and the autopsy wasn't even able to figure out her cause of death. She was also naked except for a shirt, and they found a bra tied around her neck. They tried to bring John in for more questioning, but he refused to talk. The police eventually got a warrant to run a luminol test on his pickup truck, where they found evidence of blood in several areas. But the evidence was limited at best. They charged John, but the best they could do was involuntary manslaughter because of the lack of evidence. John pleaded no contest and got an 8-15 to 15 year sentence in prison. Even the judge wanted to see him go away for life, but the evidence couldn't support the crime. While John was in prison, he admitted to the prison psychologist that he frequently had violent fantasies about killing women and having sex with their dead bodies. I actually have a news clip of an interview with the prison psychiatrist. When he came to prison, he was a 37-year-old male. Uh, he, he had those uh, disturbing fantasies since he was a young man. 
He described his fantasies to a prison psychiatrist in 1995, after already killing a woman in Kalamazoo County. He said the fantasy started when he was just 11 years old, that an imaginary friend told him about having sex with dead women. John ended up serving a little over 12 years and was released in 2007. Once he was set free, he moved north. He created his own religion and became a pastor at the Christ Community Fellowship Church in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. A few people began to trickle in and soon enough he had a small congregation. But at this point he was now a single man. His wife finally divorced him when he went to prison again. But eventually he met another woman named Sally Gay who lived in a trailer park about 11 miles west of Mount Pleasant. The two soon got engaged, but it was only a matter of time before his impulses caught up to him. He didn't want to harm his fiancée Sally, so instead he wanted her daughter Rebecca. And as the weeks passed by, he began fantasizing more and more about having sex with dead women. For John, Rebecca seemed like an obvious victim, and he was finally ready to carry out his evil fantasies. Early on Halloween morning 2012, John walked over to Rebecca's mobile home not far from his. It was before sunrise and he was still drunk from the night before. Once he got inside the mobile home, he stumbled around and he quickly found Rebecca and struck her over the head with a rubber mallet. Over and over again, he swung the hammer until Rebecca's skull cracked and she fell unconscious. He then took a large zip tie out of his pocket and placed it around her neck. He yanked on the edge of the zip tie as hard as he could until it locked down on her throat. Rebecca was slowly being suffocated to death. Meanwhile, John was removing all of her clothes. When it was all over, John heard a small cry from the next room over, and when he cracked the door, he saw Rebecca's three-year-old son, Conway, in his crib. John then dragged Rebecca's naked body about a half mile to a nearby ditch and dumped it behind a few pine trees. He then went back to the trailer and babysat Conway for a while. As he sobered up, he realized that since it was Halloween, Conway would be going trick-or-treating later, so he dressed him up in his Halloween costume and dropped him off to his father in a grocery store parking lot. Both the boy and the father were completely unaware of what had just happened. It just seemed like any other Halloween. But Rebecca's co-workers noticed that she didn't show up for work, which was odd, so they reported her missing to the police. The police began their search, and John gave his little speech to the congregation, asking for them to pray for Rebecca's return. It didn't take the police very long to start looking at John, and they brought him in for questioning as they knew he had a history of violence and prior convictions. Their strategy was to try to make John feel guilty about the fact that Rebecca's body was probably out there decomposing somewhere in the cold rain, and this strategy worked because a day later John confessed. He admitted to killing Rebecca, and he gave them the exact location of her body. He also told them that he was addicted to pornographic videos that involved necrophilia, and when they asked him if he had sex with her body, all he said was that he didn't remember. Either way, the police at this point thought they had enough evidence to put John D. White away forever. It had been 32 years since his first known violent attack against a woman. And in April 2013, they got exactly that. John was sentenced to 56 years in prison. He was 55 years old at the time, so he would most likely spend the rest of his life behind bars. And thankfully he did. Only four months later, they found him hanging in his prison cell just after 4 a.m. on August 28, 2013. Prison staff had tried to revive him, but it was no use. The killer with an obsession with necrophilia was gone. His son Gabriel from his first marriage later said that he was completely crazy until the end. John D. White wasn't the only unhinged killer who chose Halloween to carry out their crimes. Teresa Venegas was 16 years old on Halloween night 2006. She was the youngest of three sisters who always brushed her sister's hair and did their nails. They were inseparable growing up, but on Halloween, Teresa went out with a group of friends, and she was last seen walking around Green K Subdivision in Dickinson, Texas, and she never returned home that night. After frantically searching for three days, what police feared most was finally confirmed. They found her body in a field a few miles away from her home. She had been strangled, raped, and all of her long hair had been cut off. And to this day, they've never found her killer but her family hasn't given up hope. Local police have interviewed around 50 people and followed multiple leads, but her killer is still out there. One of the most interesting parts of her case is where her body was found. Her remains were discovered in a large, open, 25-acre patch of land, and this land was all too familiar with local police. The place had been given the name The Killing Fields, 
and since the early 1970s, 30 murder victims have been found there. Most were girls or young women between the ages of 12 and 25, and many of them had similar features. The area has been described as the perfect place to kill someone and get away with it. Refineries and the I-45 highway are close by, and if you screamed in these fields, no one would hear you. And if you ran for your life, there would be nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. Some of the victims were last seen here and then never seen again. And the others were last seen elsewhere, but they ended up here after their horrific deaths. Since 2006, Teresa was the last known victim discovered here after that gruesome Halloween night. But many believe that she won't be the last because they have yet to figure out who this potential serial killer may be. Hopefully one day we'll find out who's behind all these murders and bodies being found in the killing fields. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. I hope you had a safe and fun-filled Halloween. If you enjoy the Lights Out podcast, make sure you're following us on Spotify, especially subscribed on YouTube, or if you're an Apple person, make sure you subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. It really does help to show out. Also, for updates on the show, be sure to check me out on TikTok at Lights Out Cast or Instagram and Twitter at Lights Out Cast as well. But I'll see you next week. And until then, lights out, everybody.